Hi everyone. Uh, am I audible and is the screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right. Thanks, Vikas. Uh, I will just uh, yeah. I think we'll just wait for a couple of more minutes before we start. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to uh, week 3 of this uh, problem solving slash discussion session uh, for the basic course in ornithology. Just to reintroduce myself again to those who don't know me, uh, I am Chiti Arvind, a PhD student at Isa Tirupati and uh, I along with Jobin am a TA for this course. So looks like the turnout is lower than usual. I don't know if there is a steady <laughs> dropout in the numbers but uh, uh, is everyone is everyone enjoying the course so far? Of course ma'am. <laughs> it's such a beautiful thing. So many learned and uh, to say that this is the uh, just the basics you know and the scope and capacity of uh, 
getting deeper into it it's so much i personally enjoying this course a lot ma'am <laughs> right that's great that's great yeah it's quite uh, in fact yeah it is quite detailed so that it's not in the sense quite basic <laughs> probably have about I think ten people, almost. Okay. Mm. All right. So for the first question, mm, which of the following statement is false with respect to clutch size? Birds in temperate areas lay larger clutches than those in tropical regions. Birds in tropical areas lay larger clutches than those in temperate regions. Birds in tropical areas lay smaller clutches than those in temperate regions. Clutch size increases as we move from lower to higher latitudes. Okay, Harini says B. Maybe B, I guess. Okay. Ma'am, we need to find the false one, ma'am. False yeah, statement. yeah, yeah. The false statement, yeah. In such a case, B is very obviously the answer. Yeah. Right. Okay. So B, lot of answers for B. Uh, ma'am, for the choice I made, the reason is clutch size doesn't depend on the altitude, ma'am. It's more. Ah, uh, uh, it's latitude. So, oh, latitude. Sorry, I misread it, ma'am. So sorry. It's okay. We we all do the same during the exams. Speaking from experience. Also, wouldn't that size increase uh, depending upon the latitude? Higher latitude, have uh, higher clutch size. Higher clutch size I think we are talking about like in a general trend. Of course, yes, you will have outliers. Talking about, let's just okay, let's just put one minute. Let's yes, just sir, specify sorry. passerines. Let's just talk about passeriforms here. Uh, okay, uh, ma'am. Actually, before you ask about passerines, I thought B uh, can't be the uh, solution because uh, when you see. Uh, A tropical bird has a clutch size of uh, like four to five uh, eggs per time, but when you go to uh, the temperate regions and even to the poles, it, it it minimizes to only one, and that to one in a couple of years, not every year. So, oh, actually, what bird are you talking about, Lakshmi? Uh, what ma'am? Which passeriform are you talking about with like one? No, no, no. Uh, Before you uh, ask. Oh about right, right. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, let's just stick to passive forms. Okay. Could you maybe give us examples? Uh, of a passive form. That's right. Ah, uh, sure. Like passive forms are the most commonly known uh birds that. Usually you see everywhere. So, for example, like if you take uh, in India, you might um, let's say uh, paradise flycatcher, Asian paradise or Oriental paradise, Indian paradise flycatcher. That's a passeriform. Or a uh, Malabar whistling thrush. That's a passeriform. Any songbird. Malab- Malabar. Malabar what? Sir? Sorry. Malabar what bird? Malabar whistling thrush. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, like any any small like any flycatcher, any flycatcher, Asian brown flycatcher, any wobbler. Ma'am, wobbler have large clutch size, ma'am. 
they yeah like but wobblers wobble. in like wobblers are breeding where uh in the wetlands around the uh, uh, i'm sorry i'm getting confused between red wobblers and normal wobblers no no you're correct but where do wobblers breed i think you have b- brought an interesting point uh around wetlands ma'am and wetlands are found around equator uh Not mm. the wetlands are more than temperate wetlands, no ma'am. Mm. Temperate, but but, temperate, but, but, uh, but where are, are the wobblers land. breeding? Uh, I'm sorry. Water. Uh, okay. Sorry, Maria. Uh, sorry, Govind. They are breeding in Eastern Himalayas. Eastern Himalayas. So most of the wobbler species are migratory, and they visit the tropics during the winter right so yeah so rusbey has made a interesting point they breed in the temperate regions so they come to warmer grounds in the winter during the non breeding season and then they go back to higher latitudes where they breed during the temp- uh, during the summer so all the wobblers that you see here like blitz reed wobbler greenish green all these what the species are migratory uh, then b is correct i guess yeah so yeah so b is the uh, correct answer and uh, why is this why is it that birds in tropical areas lay smaller clutches than temperate regions why do birds in temperate regions as a general trend why do they lay larger clutches in temperate regions uh, maybe their uh, year uh, of existence is less lifespan is less uh mm, less life span more of springs larger life span lesser of springs uh okay we're going to cover this in a uh, later slide it actually their availability of food is very for less span of uh, time period where in tropical uh okay just reevaluate yeah, that line. in temperate man temperate food the availability is for the minimum time right during the summer yes, season or something is right like, yeah govind they have to make the most of it they have to make the most of it during the breeding season like in the temperate region they have a smaller window so they have to have the as much as possible also during in temperate areas there are less predators and less uh, competition compared to tropical areas uh um, i'm not sure about the predator predation part well probably relatively yes sure but uh, yeah so most of you have like mentioned the thing small window for food availability and what is what else is different between the temperates and the tropics well of course it contributes Topic. to the driver of food availability yeah temperature exactly right what is the difference in the temperature between the tropics and the temperate Tempera- temperate are much cooler than tropics uh so extended mm, period of winter than the you know summer or spring mm okay sure but uh let's let's uh, if you say how w- what does the temperature look like throughout the year like yeah so that's it My correct variability in temperature so what is the difference between the variability in temperature uh it's extreme ma'am in temperate like they you get snowfall as well as a uh, bit of sunshine but in tropics it's uh, it amounts to almost same like uh, summer and rainy season like that you know the temperature varies are a bit of an extreme in temperate than the tropics right exactly so that's the that's the main thing uh there's a more chance of falling prey in the tropics Hence the clutch size is. Uh, mm, so clutch size is smaller in the tropics actually. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, since uh, the in the temperate region, there are more predators. Uh, so yeah. Is the food availability is difficult in the eastern countries also harsher? Uh, wouldn't it be more difficult and more strenuous for the parents to raise a larger brood? uh would it be wouldn't it be more okay so well that's why they have a very small breeding window right so during that breeding window the food availability is abundant so for them to go and search for food is much easier 
during that small window so it's easier for them to allocate all their resources to parental care within a small window sorry okay no no um, i just had another follow up question to that yeah uh could could some clearly moment together hypothesis might be identified in this case i'm you know, i'm not hearing you clearly to... sorry yeah uh is it better now yeah audible? yeah yeah huh. Uh, 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 like to have the warmer together hypothesis, which is usually applied to adults or the population as a whole. Uh, could that be applicable to you know having more uh, uh, offsprings and since they spend a certain amount of the time as fledglings together, so being a uh, temperate region with a lesser temperature overall, uh, would it be beneficial to them being together in larger numbers? Which hypothesis? A uh, warmer together hypothesis, uh, like being together for. Uh, Well, I, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not understanding this hypothesis. Moment together hypothesis. Sorry, could you just type warmer, that in? Warmer, warmer, warmer. Warmer together hypothesis. Sorry, this is the first time I'm hearing this. I have no idea. Oh, uh, uh, maybe I'm uh, taking it up. Me, but if they do it, going together, they usually do so. They also have to uh, minimize heat losses, right? Uh, oh okay so this is okay so yeah. well they are usually breeding during the warmer period so they don't they, they don't need to keep warm as such in the sense of they need to expend extra energy to keep warm during like the warm season where they are breeding so the breeding season is usually timed in the warm uh, season usually when there is abundance of food and maybe it's usually timed in and around rainfall right so the weather is not cold when it's raining okay yeah so okay, yeah so so i don't think it is beneficial for any of the birds to breed during like so that's why you have migratory birds right so all those migrants they migrate to warmer areas during winter yes yes sorry your voice is breaking but i hope that sorted uh, i i have a doubt sorry for digressing from the topic uh, what if uh, uh, if it is like the reverse that's rare but still those birds which migrate to india for uh, uh, breeding purposes not uh, you know uh, non breeding purposes but there are birds which come here to breed right uh, but so, i'm not sure if they come from the temperate here to breed Oh, okay so okay. they are usually like probably coming like across the tropics like i think like africa to india migration for the breeding season or something like that yeah oh, okay ma'am but I thought, uh, that, uh, i thought that like if uh, if it is the reverse case uh, if the uh, birds are coming to uh, india for migration during spring or summer season how that affects the clutch size that's what i wanted to ask why do you okay uh, maybe let's not get into clutch size as per se but why do you think that is not happening could you think of any reasons as to why they are not coming to india to breed during the warm warmer or winter or whatever uh, maybe the uh, the food array they have like the food uh, uh, what the prey they what they prey on what they eat maybe that's not abundant here at that time of the day uh, year like summer or spring mm, but the migratory birds are also eating food right when they come here no oh, ma'am seriously i have no idea ma'am no i'm i'm just uh, it's it's, it's an open question yeah go ahead <laughs> go go win uh or my get one yes. I, okay so. one second one second hang on okay let go win go first then shavan yeah uh, your question was why uh, why don't birds come to india to breed in from the temperate yeah so it's yeah, basically why, based why the, on what lakshmi just said right now like if the reverse happened so why is that not happening why what could you think other reasons well i think it is common sense right ma'am uh, during the winter the temperate regions are harsh cold and uh, very have very low amounts of food uh, and they come to uh, tropical regions uh, since it's a uh, relatively uh, stable climate and we have a lot of food as well however in the tropical regions due to the stable amount of food there's also a lot more competition here uh, a lot more and relatively more uh, chances of predation uh, so it's a trade up to uh, living in the tropical region and when after 
spring arrives and when the, uh, the summer season begins in the temperate region, the birds uh, go back there to breed. Uh, due to the harsh climate uh, during the winter season, the, the number of predators and number of uh, amount of competition is decreased. And now the summer season, the, uh, the food has become abundant. Lesser competition, higher amount of resources the yeah sure all valid points i have no idea as to what the answer is because this is a hypothetical situation but yeah uh, oh amarnath the uh, correct answer is uh, b for the question that's on the slide but yeah uh, so yes ruzbe also, also says competition yeah govin uh, yeah, with regards to my previous question, do, do warblers breed in uh, eastern Himalayas? Mm -hmm. Are they considered them? Do warblers breed in eastern Himalayas? I actually do not know that. Uh, maybe you could just Google that right now and see. I'm not sure if they are breeding there or not. But I think they are winter visitors. I'm not sure. Which one? Well, I, I, I live here. See, in a lecture that there are warblers uh, rather uh, congregate in the eastern Himalayas, I think. And uh, and when you said that they come here and it seems like a temperate region, so I thought so. Correct, but are they breeding there? Well, uh, I can't hear the word. Sorry? Well, the huge group in itself, right? So there are some which are local, some which are migratory. Right, correct, correct. Yeah, they yeah. all don't come so from the same place. Yeah, these trees, warblers, climbers, they are local. I mean, you get them in India, you'll be breeding in India, I suppose. Which, but, which? Uh, sorry, I don't know. Sorry, I don't, I don't know about the resident warblers in India, and I don't know if there are any. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. please read and uh, these are resident. Right. For quite a long time. Uh, climber is also, climber is quite rare. No, I don't think Blitzreed are resident. Well, there might be a few uh, vagrant. Uh, no, ma'am. Blitzreed, Blitzreed warbler is a migrat migratory uh, uh, bird because yeah. this year we tracked it in the sense not exactly the scientific way. I use eBird and uh, through that I tracked it. Usually, is uh, definitely is a migrant, ma'am. Yeah, even I thought Blitzreed yeah. is yeah, a migrant. It engages into local migrations more than uh, inter, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, 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 no. It's, it comes from outside only. It's not local. Blitz and that would be an interesting thing that I'd like to see. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I think we are all learning. I'm just, uh, I don't know if everyone has this app called Merlin, but it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you can yeah. just check yeah, the. We use it, ma'am. We use it daily. Yeah. I'm just what looking app? up Blitz Read. What about Glamour? Do you mean any idea about it? I think that's also migratory. Uh, uh, glamorous, uh, I think it's locally uh, 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 migrant, like from north to south India, like that. But definitely, where I am, where I live, that part of India, south India, glamorous, booted, uh, blitz, uh, green, greenish, all are uh, migrants and they come during the winter after uh, October, I guess. And they leave by May to uh, April, they will leave. So I suppose they are local migrants. I'm not sure about the uh, leaves. Leaves also I have seen throughout the year, at least in the place where I live. So oh, okay. uh, maybe that's a local like, uh, resident or something. But yeah. for where yeah. I live, leaves uh, comes from the local Okay, possible. That's because probably you are down south. So in central India, I suppose they are local. Uh, I think you might just have some vagrants that are yes. residents. Yes in uh, yeah. central India but otherwise okay, I think exactly. yeah the blitz reed are migratory so clamorous okay. reed as per the wikipedia page shows that it's uh, it breeds uh, not in India the non-breeding is in India so yeah okay, okay. so there was a migratory yes okay. yes okay. yeah thank you uh, what is the app description sorry what was the app you mentioned ma'am uh, Merlin, M-E-R-L-I-N. Let me just put that in. Merlin. Uh, some wobblers do breed in the Himalayas. Uh, okay, one second. I'm confused. Aren't we looking at a false statement? Isn't D false? Am I missing something? Okay, uh, no, actually B is false because birds in tropical areas lay smaller clutches than those in temperate regions. 
Is that okay, Biju? Uh, Rusbe, some wobblers do greet the Malayas. Not sure which many cameras reads in India, as far as I know. Mm, okay, I don't know. The map seems to show something else. Harni says D statement is same thing as A and C. Yeah, good spot. Uh, okay, and uh, yeah, so Merlin is the app. Uh, yes, Shravan, did you have something to add? Cloth size increases. I got confused uh, in between, like uh, when we were discussing. Okay, is it like clear now, or is it more confusing? Uh, no, regarding the tropical and uh, temperate regions, you have uh, said like why don't they breed and so. Uh, oh, okay, so I that was. That question. Oh, this question that is on the uh, screen what's right the, now. Ma'am, what's the status of Lee map? Is it true or false? Clutch sizes increase, right? If we move from lower to higher uh, latitudes. So that's why temperate regions have, like, as Harini mentioned, like, D is the same as A and C. So, yeah, okay. it's okay. true. Uh, yeah, Shravan, sorry. No, uh, I'm still stuck up in that place. Uh, so, okay, so, I didn't get that. Okay, so clutch size is smaller in tropical areas because they have a large breeding window and they can perhaps nest multiple times also during the year and they don't have a crunch on resources because resources are also really uh, very uh, abundantly available and the temperature is not very starkly different uh, across the year in the tropics but in the temperate regions they lay larger clutch sizes because they have a very small window of laying period because the temperatures are highly contrasting during the breeding and the non-breeding season so they uh, focus all their resources uh, towards breeding in the season where the availability of resources is high so it's a very small window so they lay a large number of eggs uh, and they during the season okay. yes okay. yeah isn't D also false? Uh, D is not false, right? It's true because the clutch sizes get larger as we move towards the temperates from the tropics. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I hope that is okay. I'll just go to the next one. Okay, so what is optimal clutch size? Does anyone have an idea of what is optimal clutch size? Um, optimal clutch size. Uh, hang on, hang on, Lakshmi. Maybe we'll go with the hand raising. Uh, yeah, Govind, you can go ahead. Well, the greatest amount of uh, the greatest clutch size, the greatest amount of eggs, which can be uh, raised successfully by the planning. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. Any any additional points to what Govind has mentioned? Yeah, go ahead, Lakshmi. Uh, optimal clutch size is the number of eggs per episode, uh, which uh, helps in the, uh, uh, which doesn't uh, deter the birds. Uh, let me say it in my own words, ma'am. Sorry, I am. Uh, okay. Uh, Optimal clutch size is the uh, amount, uh, amount of eggs laid by parent birds which balances between the energy invested in parenting as well as their uh, life uh, span ma'am. I mean okay. like, uh, uh, it's like uh, the amount of energy invested should be such that uh, their lifespan shouldn't, uh, their whole life shouldn't be uh, invested in um, bringing up the uh, kids as well as their survival rate of the eggs is also balanced. Right, sure, yeah, okay, that is, that is correct. Uh, Ma'am, could I uh, uh, explain my answer in a Yeah, sure. The optimal clutch size is the, uh, is the greatest, uh, greatest clutch size or the greatest number of eggs. Is the what, sorry, graded, what, what, what is that word you used? Greatest. I don't know if I'm hearing wrong or like what is wrong. But the biggest. Okay, okay, okay. The biggest, uh, biggest number of eggs, the biggest plus size per reproduction episode, which uh, which increases the uh, reprodu uh, individual fitness throughout its lifetime. Yeah, sure. That 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 is also yeah. That would also go. 
anyone else would like to add anything to uh, so the maximum number of eggs laid for uh, for season for breeding season yeah uh, and uh, in addition to the number of eggs laid what should also be included in this Uh, so breeding success. Breeding success. What is breeding success? Could I mean the clutch uh, successfully hatched. Correct. Right. So what is another word for that? Sorry. Parity. Parity. Okay, that's the first time I'm hearing for that that term. Fitness. Sorry, fitness. Okay. Mm. Something Fecundity. much more simpler Fecundity. than that. Sorry, what? Fecundity. Fecundity is reproductive success. That is of the parent. Yeah, survival rate. Correct. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Survival rate. And uh, even if the... So, you have survival... So, the survival is like a really broad term, right? So, you have first... Survival is it till uh, last, like a, uh, the hatchling... Uh, grows up to the fledgling yeah you're close to the the correct thing yeah haritan says uh, haritaran sorry says survive to adulthood uh yes survive to uh, what is adulthood survive to breeding correct correct and uh, that that's absolutely right and what is that does anyone have an idea as to what that is called there is a term for this Survive to reproductive age. Correct. Yeah. So there's a term for this sentence. Fertility rate, mm, No, that's again based on the parents. Not so reproduction fitness. Reproduction <laughs> fitness. Uh, sorry, Ruzbe. I think it's fitness. Fitness. Yeah, but fitness is again like a large so term. Reproductive fitness, maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, sure, Govind, yeah. Brooding. <laughs> no. Successfully brooding. Uh, uh, yeah, you you the, the, the term is correct. Like whatever you are saying, whatever the explanation everyone is giving is correct. But I don't know if you've heard of this term, it's called recruitment. Right? Okay. So recruitment is the word where uh, they get like recruited into the population, which means that they are receptive and can breed. So that's that's the term, yeah. Okay, so similar everyone. To how, uh, similar to? Uh, to sorry, now uh, an analogy is similar to uh, to children growing up to join the workforce. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think yeah, similar analogy. Yeah. So if you read a lot of papers based on like breeding success, fitness, or I don't know. Uh, several different things on life history traits especially of chicks you will uh, you will find this word often like till the recruitment age till they get recruited into the population yes Ruzbe no Ruzbe you can if anything you can go ahead Sorry, sorry. Uh, I no think I, I kind of muted myself again. <laughs> no, I said uh, this is a bit confusing for me because survival to adulthood mm-hmm. uh, in relation to class size is different from fitness because I remember there was some uh, uh, paper which uh, I don't even remember the species. That's okay. Part of the videos which said that, you know, if, if, if a pair mm-hmm. over exceeds, I think it was in the context of the kestrels, if they over exceed their class size, in one year, mm. even if the fledglings do grow, uh, it, it is quite likely that in the next year the same pair will have uh, will not breed or will have fewer eggs. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, mm-hmm. if you look at it in that sense, then its uh, class size uh, in relation to fitness would be different from the survival rate of one clutch, if you know what I mean. Survival rate of one clutch. So basically, you are saying that clutch sizes reduce in a pair as they increase in age, right? No, I mean that uh, supposedly optimal clutch size is say five eggs. Okay. And 
uh, so which means that the maximum uh, uh, eggs hatch into you know uh, uh, fledglings which grow on to reproduce. Sure. But if uh, the player has seven eggs in a year, mm -hmm. then the next year they are likely to have three eggs or you know less, much less than the optimal or something. Sure. There was one study uh, sure. like that. Uh, it was part of the videos. Right. So yeah, I think it's just a play of trade-offs. So you might find the uh, clutch sizes to either go like seven, three, 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 three till whatever. If they can lay a total number of, I don't know, let's say twenty eggs, or it can go like seven, 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 and then that's it. That's the end of them. Or they go like five, 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 five consistently for a longer period of time. So, but what I meant is survival to uh, adulthood is not necessarily uh, linked to optimal clutch size because there are other factors. Sure. Like less eggs in the you know uh, sure. next next season. Sure. But if you see an overall fitness of an individual, uh, you will have to take into account all the clutches throughout the lifespan of that individual that that individual has laid or, uh, yeah parented so when you say reproductive fitness uh, it's very difficult to classify reproductive fitness just across a few seasons ideally in a gold standard situation it should be uh, across its entire lifetime so if clutch size i mean it's just a factor but probably it's recruitment so even if they laid seven eggs how many of them actually survived till adulthood so that's where the recruitment factor comes into uh, determining what is uh, fitness for an, that individual because ultimately it's a game of genes right so the more number of individuals you can pass your genes to the more successful you are so maybe survival to adulthood of fledglings over the lifetime of the pair rather than for one season yes correct and that makes more sense correct correct exactly exactly All right, let me go to the next question. Okay, organisms that, yikes, what has happened to my screen? Okay, organisms that die after their first reproductive season fall under the category of Iteroparis, viviparis, semelparis, or oviparis. Okay, semelparis. C, 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 C. Okay. Okay, there are a lot of people here. There are like, I think, 20 people. I think I want, I'm going to wait for 20 answers. I really do appreciate all the people who are participating. A lot of C's coming in. Ma'am, are there any examples in birds? I don't think so, right? <laughs> that a semel pair is not that uh, I am aware of. Not that I'm aware of. I don't think so, ma'am. Birds, uh, I don't think birds come under. Yeah. Could you could you give an example of some semelparous species for everyone? Well, I can give plenty of uh, others like salmon, salmon, fish, a monarch, butterfly, cicada, cicada. Laughing dove. Laughing dove has only uh, I think laughing dove or spotted dove. I, I don't know, but the dove has a life expectancy of only one year. What? After they uh, have a 
uh, I mean, they lay eggs. They uh, they lay eggs. They grow up again. They lay eggs. They, I mean, uh, they lay eggs and they die in one year or something. Is that Their so? Their lifespan is very less. Laughing and, dove. Okay, and Haridharan says black hole problem. I don't remember that. I I I remember reading it in uh, some uh, readers digest or some book. I don't remember exactly the source, but yeah, there is one dove uh, variety which a species which. Uh, Actually, it's very life size, life span is one or one and a half years, and all they do is they fer- uh, they fertilize, uh, they uh, they breed, and then they uh, of a bird, the, huh? The bird. Hmm, seems a bit uh, I don't know sketchy because yeah, I know I I would not think of a pigeon or a columbidae family bird living for one year, so that's a bit odd. I I'm not sure about the black pole warbler, but. Uh, do you do you know anything? Bird dies after the migration, so it just lives for one year. Black pole war. Uh, Haritaran, do you have any extra info on that? I can give an example of a mammal bird. Of a mammal, okay, go ahead. Uh, it's called it's a marsupial actually called a called a brown antichinus. Okay, I think you got to type that in. I can't catch the name. Okay, and so it uh, just lives for one season. Okay, I need to look up the this. Brown antikinus. Okay, I don't know what this even looks like, but okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, any any other information on the black pole wobbler? I'm trying to look it up, but I'm not able to find I, it. I don't think so. Any bird? Uh, sorry, one of you. I don't get a bird in uh, Samad Paris. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, it's an insects like arthropods like ascorpions yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have this brain mantis as well. Right. After making the Correct, correct, yeah. But not in birds. <laughs> Green cave, please. Yeah. With regards to the mammal I mentioned, the brown anti the male breeds so much, so furiously that it Literally dies from uh, the PSO. <laughs> and the female, like, females. Uh, oh, yeah, it's, like, a, it's a rodent uh, species actually. It's a rodent. Uh, species. Species. Let's look at this. What does this look like? Oh, yeah, it does look like a rodent. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah, that's 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 on breeding with the different females, polyhedral. I see. All oh, right. It says they die as a result of stress and exhaustion. Okay, awesome. Uh, it doesn't even uh, give time to get itself fed. I see, yeah. Okay, so V Sant has uh, sent a paper. So you guys can check this out. Mammalian example of similar parity. Okay. How old is this paper? Seems quite old. Can't find the year in it, but yeah, cool. Uh, Okay, so okay now all of you know what are the what are, what is viviparous? Live for young ones are oh you definitely given birth. Right, all right, yeah, and oviparous is like pretty obvious. Okay, I will go to the next question. So, dash birds are those that are born blind and need a significant amount of parental care to be used. What is the scientific term for these birds? Precaution. Okay, Lakshmi says precaution. Altrician. Govan says altrician. Altrician, yeah, sorry. Ravan says altricial, Rushikesh says altricial. Uh, most of the passerines, 
Mm-hmm. Most, Most of the, the passerines. Right. In fact, all the all uh, not only passerines but uh, oceans, all the songbirds and everything. Yeah, oceans yeah. So oceans, yeah, everything. Passerines are the umbrella for oceans and suboceans. So everything gets included in that. Ma'am, all large birds are precocial. All large birds are precocial. Mm, so I don't know where the line between small and large lies, because you do have some large passeriforms as well, right? And you might have small. Uh, I don't know. Give me an example of an. Uh, give me examples of precocial birds. A stock. Ducks and uh, quails and corn ducks. Yeah, so quails are pretty s- small, right? Quails, ma'am. Like bush quail and button quails, they are quite tiny. Uh, are they that tiny? I mean, yeah, like button quails are like that much. Like, yeah, like several passeriforms are precocial. larger. They are like smaller than, uh, uh, I don't know. Well, like a, I, I don't know, like smaller than a minor. But they are precocial. They are precocial, yeah. So I wouldn't say larger the bird, precocial they are. I think it's a lot to do about even their habit and where they are. So a lot of uh, uh, precocial birds are born in areas where. So so what is the difference between? Precocial and altricial. Raptors are large, but they certainly don't have precocial. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. A lot of character. Right. Yeah. Good point. Uh, precocial, uh, precocial uh, chicks doesn't need. Uh, they are the parents don't invest much of energy in parenting. Correct. Altri, altricial is the investing of energy. Investment, energy investment is high. Uh, in fact, some uh, species goes on to live with the parents until they have fledged properly also. Yeah. Uh, until their mating season, they uh, ride on their parents' back or something. So, yeah. Uh, exactly. Wow. So, it's also, I think, to do with uh, the frequency at which they are laying eggs or producing offspring. Like, the best example of probably a precocial bird is your... Uh, chicken. Oh, Which one? Grey-headed swamp hen. Sure, grey-headed swamp hen. Yeah, I'm not sure if everyone has seen, but uh, like your chicken, right? Like the chicks hatch and they are already running around. And they are uh, for feeding. Sorry. They are out from the nest uh, for feeding. Yeah, and they don't particularly have nests. Also, you know, I mean, they'll just probably. I don't know if anyone has been to a farm, but uh, yeah, they just like lay the egg anywhere in probably like a nest or not a nest. Some are in the nest, some are not in the nest. uh, Red wattle lapwings also. Usually all the lapwings, they also lay eggs on the uh, Yeah, yeah. So all the waders, all these caratary farms, they have precocial chicks because uh, the birds need to get up and moving fast, right? And uh, since parental care is not involved, I mean, probably is involved to some extent, uh, but not as uh, uh, intensive as uh, altricial birds. Uh, yeah, precocial parent, parent investment is limited only to incubation. Once the chick hatches, there is minimal, almost no... Mm, I wouldn't say no, like in several cases, I mean, the chicks do follow the adult, right? They do have to learn how to feed themselves yeah. as well, even yeah. if they're yeah, not but, uh, fed. They, uh, they feed for themselves automatically once they hatch, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, sure. But they're still along with the parent and the parent does have some amount of, uh, like, as you mentioned, like the lapwing, they do this, uh, I don't know if you've seen, they do this broken wing display to uh yeah Ward of, uh, yeah 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 so that can be when chicks are there or eggs are there yeah govind uh, uh, my question was are all large birds because you not are not are all small birds as they kill them 
So okay. All like, yeah, I think words, uh, I think Rosebe gave an answer to that, right? You have like all these eagles and huge raptors, so they are all altricial. So, uh, but there are penguins also, ma'am, which are precocial. Yeah, I don't think the size. What about the bigger pelagics like albatross? I I think they are altricial. I'm not sure. Ah uh, yeah, I also think they are altricial. I don't, I I don't think they are precocial. But uh, size is not a measure for altricial or precocial. Yeah. Precocial, yeah. So I would stars, uh, stars and pelicans are larger birds, but they are uh, uh, altricial. Right. And uh, the swanhens and the other long nesting birds are uh, smaller, but they are uh, precocial. Right. Yeah, so there you have your answer, Govin. I'm just looking for like large birds that could be altruistic, but yeah, there are. In fact, I don't know about the albatross that just got my fancy, but I do not know. I can't find any images, but yeah, if anyone does find any images, yeah, or facts, let me know. Okay, next question. Uh, yes, I have observed that behavior of lapwing. Yeah, yeah, it's quite uh, it's quite common. This broken wing display. Okay, so here is a slide on uh, cloth size, and uh, so this is like a really cool study that was done on these uh, pied uh, collared flycatchers. And uh, what they were actually trying to see is the trade-off between clutch size and lifespan, right? So uh, what they did actually in the study was to look at uh, females that breed at different points of time. So does would anyone like to try and infer this graph? I mean, it's not. Uh, yeah, you can just give it a go. So the first one, the first graph to the left, mm -hmm. uh, it says that uh, those birds which uh, start laying eggs later in life, not earlier, mm -hmm. as soon as uh, later in life, they go on to have higher clutch size, optimal clutch size, than those birds which have started at the age of one. Right. And why do you think that is true? Because the more of the energy is not the energy invested on uh, raising the chick is managed to taking care of themselves in the later birds. You know, uh, those uh, uh, females which uh, started laying eggs late, they had enough amount of energy to be invested on themselves and their uh, maintenance. Right. So they uh, they were they were stable enough to take care of multiple broods because they were strong enough. Right. Just like just like in humans, if the mother is going to be mother is uh, strong and uh, healthy, then the offspring, the kids will be healthy also when they take birth. Right. So if they if the mother itself is weak and uh, they are not uh, and uh, need taking care of, then the kids will always be puny. So that's how the first graph. The second graph, I'm a bit uh, confused, ma'am. Okay, yeah, sure, that doesn't matter. So yeah, the first graph, base, yeah, go with. I didn't get the first question. Yeah, there was there was no question. I just asked if anyone would like to have a go at explaining the two graphs that are shown out here, and this basically shows uh, clutch sizes of uh, this pied uh, collared uh, this collared flycatcher species that is found in Sweden. Uh, ma'am, can, can we have the link to this paper, ma'am? The below link is uh, un, uh, it's ineligible, ma'am. Uh, yeah, sure. It's actually from, uh, that's a textbook. So this textbook should be available in uh, wherever you can source it from. Uh, it's called Freeman and Heron and it's called, the book is called Evolutionary Analysis. So this is a representation from this, but I'm sure there is a linked paper. If I can find this linked paper, uh, yeah, that the, the paper is actually from 1990. That's in the image here. So yeah, it's a nature paper. If you can maybe just like type that and Google it. It's Gustafson and Part 1990 Nature. Uh, acceleration of senescence in the collared flycatcher by reproductive cost. 
Okay, so the first graph, as uh, explained by Lakshmi, basically indicates a late life cost to breeding early, right? So, uh, what these people did, these two scientists, uh, in a uh, second part, they actually manipulated reprodu reproductive effort by giving the first year breeders some extra eggs. So, uh, they are focusing on this blue line population here and that has been extrapolated in the graph out here. So, if you can see, the clutch size is still 6.6, .6, right? So, that's still here. So, basically, the blue section, the blue line, which the birds that breed at the age of one, what they did was that they gave the females extra eggs. So, they divided that uh, all the birds that bred at age one into two uh, categories, into two sets. And for one set of birds, they kept giving them extra eggs. They gave them extra eggs in the first year. But for the other set, they used it as controls. So they didn't do any uh, experimental manipulation. And uh, what they found was that the ones that were given extra eggs in the first year drastically reduced their uh, clutch size in the subsequent years of breeding. Right? So this in turn strengthened their uh, claim in the first uh, experiment stating that uh, having extra eggs to take care of earlier on in life does uh, affect the fitness and the lifespan or the clutch size in subsequent years. So this is what uh, we were discussing earlier, Ruzbe, if this makes sense. Could you again explain the first graph I didn't I'm not good at reading graphs. Okay, so basically, okay, so first graph what you have is age out here on the x axis and clutch size, which is a number of eggs uh, in the breeding season uh, on the y axis. So, uh, individuals start their breeding at different points of time. So, for individuals that bred at the age of one, their clutch size was uh, for 62, for a sample size of 62 the clutch size was about 5.8 so roughly about 6 eggs right and uh, for uh, the individuals that uh, started breeding in the second year their clutch size was for 8 individuals was higher which is about uh, what is it 6.3 and the clutch size increased as the age also increased or it's roughly much larger than the clutch size of those individuals that started breeding at the age of one as opposed to the ones that started breeding at the age of two. So basically the ones that have started breeding at the age of two have delayed or as compared to one delayed their breeding by a year but are able to lay a larger number of eggs. Does that make sense? So does that mean the total number of uh, well, it's uh, it's probably is when you probably total it up. It probably is. I'm not sure about the survival, but uh, I think the uh, in in this case, uh, the first year breeders had a higher lifetime reproductive success than the second year breeders. Yeah. So overall, the number of eggs might be the same for both the. Uh, groups but the fact is that if uh, clutch size so what they did in the second graph is a manipulative experiment and they gave extra eggs to the first year breeders and then what they saw when they gave extra eggs to the first year breeders the um, clutch size decreased as the years progressed because they have invested so much in raising that first clutch with extra eggs yeah is that yeah, but actually, uh, in the first graph, mm -hmm. again, uh, the delayed one, the red, uh, red dots. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on third year of breeding, again, the classes is decreased. On the and vice versa, in the, uh, like in the... Cl the clutch size is actually, increased. Clutch size is increased. Not the decreased, like uh, on fourth year. Uh, yeah, out here for both. You're talking about the first graph, right? Yes, first graph. Yeah. And the fourth year, 
uh-huh. both the lines have decreased their sure. like the clutch size. Sure. But relatively, if you look at both the groups, they are relatively much different. So this is, uh, the clutch size is about, uh, I don't know, 6.6, but out here it is 5.4. So if you look, if you compare it between both the groups, they are different. Yes, they have decreased. Uh, the letter uh, has uh, given uh, more clutch size. Yes. But the pattern looks like similar, uh, like Correct. both uh, on a on a rate of uh, line line, they are decreasing their uh, clutch size. Sure. Yes. I don't know what is and the lifespan. Both the graphs. Yes. Yes. It's you're 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 correct. you're correct. You're correct. You're correct. You're absolutely correct. The clutch size is decreasing, but relatively, this one still has a larger clutch size than this one because these guys started breeding one year earlier. So that is clear, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I will move to the next question. Okay, so female phalaropes have a mating system which is dash in nature where the females mate with multiple males. B, okay. Okay, B, polyandrous, polyandrous. What is sorry? Phalarope. Uh, this bird that you see out here in this picture, that's a phalarope. Uh, where the female is much more uh, brightly ornamented and brightly uh, plumaged. Mm, not particularly, actually. In fact, I uh, <laughs> I did look these up and kids. both the males and the females during the breeding season look kind of similar. Okay, but I read somewhere that uh, the females are the ones who take care of the brood and uh, uh, the females they don't give a hood to it and they go off. Correct, off of correct. It. Yeah, that is, that, is, that is absolutely correct. Yeah. So that is why it is a system that is known as uh, polyandry, which is, it's, it's very, uh, it's not at all common in birds, polyandry. And I think the lecture had another example. I forgot, uh, what was it? The sandpiper? Spotted sandpiper. Spotted sandpiper. Yeah, the spotted sandpiper is another example uh, where it is the, um, uh, um, um, male that looks after the chicks and invests in parental care as opposed to the female. Yes, yes, they are caradriforms. They fall under the order of caradriforms. Yeah. Yeah, they have these long legs and they, well, they mm, definitely do look like waders. Uh, so, yeah, I think everyone has. So, yeah, since the males are the ones performing the uh, incubation and uh, uh, parental care activities, the females uh, can attempt to find another male during, like, multiple males during the same breeding season as well. So, yeah, I don't know what is the frequency of egg laying in the species, but I am assuming it uh, must be quite high. So, after she lays eggs in one nest, uh, she might be receptive to lay more eggs in another nest. Yeah. Okay. So, tell me what is a lek and what happens in a lek? Uh, yeah, Lakshmi. Lek is a, a large gathering of uh, usually I know only of one lek that is sand grouse lek. Okay. Uh, where uh, the males probably the males compete with each other mm -hmm. with more of, of for uh, uh, females' uh, attention right. and also small territory. They create their own small territory around them during this lake and they uh, show off their 
skills of uh, uh, no, protecting their uh, territory as well as the most showiest and the most, uh, 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 what to say, uh, fittest bird because in the sense, they, uh, the showing of their plumages and their special adaptations for showing things, they go on doing it relentlessly and those males which are tired, they, uh, they are usually the losers and those who go on keeping showing the plumages and everything, they win and these uh, female birds, they go from each male to the other male, they check whether uh, it's, uh, they have the ability to be sire other kids, their kids and then slowly they will uh, uh, select uh, those uh, male which are strong in the sense persevering and as well as uh, uh, enough to you know, take care of their territory and then they choose and then they breed and one uh, uh, one male can uh, uh, have uh, one male can breed with many females there in fact all the females go to that one bird which is selected okay. so it, it, it happens in a open area and it is a uh, spectacle to see it's very good i just saw it in the corner labs uh, um, Oh, great morning. So, those who haven't seen, I actually have the videos uh, in the lecture. So, I'm going to play them for everyone to view them as well. Yeah. So, does anyone else have anything to add to what is a lek? Uh, Ma'am, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear uh, uh, that explanation. So, I'll just give my own. Uh, okay. Lek is a resource free uh, area. Uh, where males can, uh, where females gather and males have an opportunity to display their, uh, uh, display their uh, reproductive uh, superiority and uh, gain more females. Man. Right, okay. Yeah, sure, that is correct. Right, uh, question. Sorry? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Sachin. It's yeah, more, it's like Swayamara. I have a question whether a lake can have, uh, I mean, can happen the opposite way, like females displaying and males uh, I actually, you know, interesting question. I did look this up and uh, I think there was, uh, I can't remember. Is it, uh, is it some uh, galliform species or not? I don't know if there are female legs but there are female congregations but i don't know if they are for the purpose of choosing a male because uh, yeah i don't know but uh, please do look this up i can't remember what i looked up but i also had the same question okay because uh, just I was... uh yeah sachin can remember lake as a swayamvar ma'am swayamvar in uh, oh. uh, uh, birds you know <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, the women get to choose men the way they yeah want. the way they are displaying so, sure yeah and i think that was more in line with the the physiology maybe like as i think uh, it was explained in earlier lecture that uh, uh, males have more sperms, whereas the females have uh, a single egg or something like that. Yeah. So there is abundance of sperms versus the, the lesser resources on the egg side. So, uh, so female get to choose. That, that's what I heard in earlier lecture. Right, right. So, uh, yeah. I understand that, but uh, this doubt came while I was going through the sound related lecture and there. Uh, maybe related to the great pit or some uh, this particular species, but it was a kid species, wherein they mentioned uh, it was a female which was producing more uh, uh, the, the interesting song to attract male or something. I don't know whether I heard it incorrectly. But that's when I... Uh, if you find this, this, please let me know because <laughs> <laughs> I work on acoustics and I haven't heard of this. Especially okay, of a tit species. I might be wrong in hearing that, but I'll go through that section of the lecture again and check it again. Sure. Because, but, uh, we, like, uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Otherwise, we can have a controversy stirred up right <laughs> in this <laughs> discussion forum. Yeah. But, uh, sure, I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm not aware, but... Uh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. 
One second, uh, Lakshmi. I said, one no, ma'am, not no, for no, you, no. ma'am, not for you. Yeah. Uh, there was a question in uh, chat box for which I can uh, have a ten- tangential answer to it. I just want to answer the question. I don't know uh, what the question is. Had Could you asked that, yeah, read uh, how the is question. genetic diversity maintained in species that display lacking? Um, Where is this? Uh, is this right now in the chat box? Oh, yeah, right okay, now. okay, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, the genetic diversity maintained in species that display lacking. Actually, this is what I heard in the, uh, the in this, I mean, uh, session also, and after that, I read up on that. Wherein one, uh, uh, there is not that much of uh, 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 diversity, genetic diversity in it. But yeah, uh, it's like the winner, winner's genes get uh, transfer, uh, uh, transferred to the next generation. So you don't see genetic diversity that much. But yeah, many females, uh, they mate with one male. So in that way, uh, the winner male's uh, genes are transferred. So there is not that much of genetic diversity in it. Um, my some points on the same uh, topic is uh, diversity is one aspect of uh, genetics. But another aspect is uh, what uh, the sector selection is going towards is uh, towards having stronger uh, offsprings or something or better exactly. offsprings, right? Exactly. That's what I meant. The winner in the whole leg is the one who is strongest, who is most showiest and also has a strong uh, 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 features in a sense. So, uh, it is uh, sexually selection, sexual selection is happening there. So, genetic diversity is lesser and more important to sexual selection. But the counter argument is whether uh, genetic diversity actually contributes towards the fitness, uh, fitness in the sense the strength or the uh, survival rate of the offspring or not. Okay, so I think there are like two things being addressed out here. One is immediate fitness of an individual and then you have a population level fitness, right? So genetic diversity fills in at the population level, uh, population level right. scenario, right? And also, uh, okay, so genetic selection. Okay, we're having multiple questions. Okay, so V. Sant has asked, how is genetic diversity maintained in a species that display lacking? So basically, in a lek, you have multiple individuals that are displaying, but there is one probably who uh, wins over all the other males and is, suc- and is successful in drawing all the females towards him, right? And gets an opportunity to mate with multiple females, right? Uh, here, genetic variation, genetic diversity is not a point here in this lacking ma'am. Lacking is all about sexual selection and uh, successful mating leads to a successful male for the next generation of lacking. So, uh, lacking here doesn't uh, 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 sure. address, address the general, uh, generally in general, the genetic variation, yes. But uh, tangentially we can say in that the next generation, the male, which uh, possesses the best male's uh, gene in them, Obviously, if the genes are, best genes are selected, I guess, I automatically. So, there is right. no genetic diversity uh, question at all in the world because it's making is all about sexual selection. Correct. Sexual. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, why would diversity be an issue in the case of lacking? I think uh, Vison probably assumes that the same male is winning every year, but that's not true, right? Uh, you have males overthrowing other males every year during displays. And also, uh, may I add to this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I read of something called as the leg paradox, which is it is something which is quite extensively studied, I suppose. And that is the reason I asked the question, not because that it has a particular answer or a peculiar answer, but because I wanted to open this topic. Sure. So Go ahead. Um, apparently, it is not the way. I mean, not the way we have been going about this. That the male is selected, and that so many males are competing, so it's going to be the strongest and the fittest of them that is selected. So that will. Pass the probably pass the most fittest or the best of genes, but it is rather that a genetic diversity is also a component of uh, you know uh, creating a pool of genes which are in general beneficial for the survival of the species. So at, at the collective level for a population, I suppose that would be more beneficial. So here there is a trade-off that that uh, sexual selection, like Lakshmi said, sexual selection is what is preferred 
instead of uh, you know contributing to a uh, greater genetic diversity which could have otherwise uh, given evolutionary benefits as yeah. the species goes on in the uh, course of time you are correct uh, but an individual an yeah. individual is not thinking of evolutionary fitness and evolutionary success right yeah. an individual is thinking at yes. an individual's point of view Uh, ma'am, uh, yeah, that, 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 that is not... the question. Why? Why is this behavior only selectively, uh, you know, displayed by only a few species? Why is it displayed? Oh, I don't know about how this came into uh, how lacking evolved, but that's an interesting question. And uh, please do look it up. Like, ma'am, why do certain species? Ma'am, you said that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Lakshmi. Uh, ma'am, you said that uh, uh, not uh, the same male doesn't win the every year. Uh, But, yeah. Uh, uh, there is one more an uh, aspect here when uh, the lacking, not only lacking in in general mating where the uh, males are very showy. In those species, the male's lifespan is lesser than females, no? Because uh, uh, more most of their energy is put into all the showing. Uh, I don't know about this. Huh? I don't know about Extra- whether males' lifespan is lesser than females because because no, no, because uh, uh, why I am asking this because uh, all those extra plumages, extra organs which they indulge in, they ne- it needs a lot of maintenance, a lot of energy input, right? But what so, about the female who is laying the eggs, which inherently has a higher number of energy input? Uh, uh, it is a trade-off, right? Like, um, they uh, have a taper plumage and they don't have to keep on uh, put on a show. they much more uh, like uh, they merge into the background camouflage better and uh, they can focus on bringing up the kid you know bringing up the uh, brood so i think yeah this is also an important part in uh, selection ma'am like uh, how the energy investment is and how much energy is invested where i have no idea I I I do not know in a species where males survive uh, lesser than female in birds males survive lesser than have a lesser shorter lifespan than females because of displays yes govind i see your hand raised uh, sorry ma'am i have two questions to one second hang on hang on hang on we are having like a crazy discussion here i see something in the chat is there any evidence one second one second govind Is there any evidence those species exhibiting lacking are prone prone to decline in number? Is this based on not having sites to lack, or is this based on decline in genetic diversity or whatever? I do want to know about both the site uh, availability of habitat. I I am I am uh, not sure. I don't have answers, but uh, I want to know what the question is. Uh, ma'am, I have something in relation to this. Okay, sure, and go ahead. My point was that, right? Uh, was that just lacking is lacking this uh, as a behavior displayed on species which are large in number, like uh, like a species that is inherently has a very big population or comparatively speaking has a large population size. Do they are they the ones that display uh, lacking behavior? because in such a case the genetic diversity problem i wouldn't say would, would be solved but it would be uh, minimized to the big population right ma'am uh sure interesting point uh but i'm not sure it could be like a large large number otherwise i mean i, I don't know you would see pigeons showing lacking behavior i don't know i'm just thinking of like birds found in large numbers but uh, i i'm not sure what are the factors that are driving uh, species to form legs evolutionarily but there are certain characteristics uh, uh, of species that happen to be in legs uh, i had a question by one second one second lakshmi please please wait please wait yeah i saw i hand raised right now by rusbe and we saw earlier had something so if i can come in yeah. I, uh, to answer uh, i think ariharan's question uh, of somebody who asked i believe there was something in the video about uh, species that are very well distributed where they are not likely the males are not likely or the females are not likely to encounter the males very often uh, where mm. generally the population is kind of dispersed this is where one of the factors at least that mm. kind of uh, favors a lacking uh, right uh, uh, 
behavior. Yeah, sure. Because all the males congregate in one area and it's easy access. Yeah. Yeah, valid point. Sure. Yes. Uh, yes, we son. There's such a thing seen in peacocks as the main ten. Oh my God, this is like going off into handicap principle and. Uh, yes, actually, peacock does lack of mama. Do they? Peacocks are not to lack mama. No, I think just two individuals are there. It's not like hundreds of male peacocks together displaying. I haven't seen like. I think, I think peacocks do lacking. Do they like? Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's what peacocks do. Like that's why they have this uh, long train behind them. And uh, that yeah, interesting. I I did not know. I have seen two or three males because the population was small uh, in near Nagarhode. Two or three uh, uh, females were like showing footy. But uh, two or three the, is not a length, right? Two, uh, two, no, that doesn't two, constitute lacking if it's just a couple of them. Yeah, it should be like all oh, males coming more, together. Ma'am. Females were like more. They were yeah, females are more. So it is, but the females don't display. That's the reason why you can't call it a lack. But uh, I wanted to know if there is something similar for the females here or the females. Yeah, I don't. Females don't display, and they are in, they are in larger numbers. The males will be in smaller numbers. Was doing this space, so it doesn't become so, a lack. Something else. Again, if I'm not mistaken, I think the faculty. I think it was Dr. Moshami Ghosh. I think she mentioned peafowl in connection to lacking. But oh, I is it? Okay, it. we can we can go back to the lecture time, notes. Like, you know, you must have all yeah. seen a peafowl, uh, peacock uh, dance or something, or they collect or something like that. I no, it is it is known that I think peacocks are known for lectures. So that is for sure. I don't. Okay, cool. Then that is sorted. If it's mentioned in the le- in the lecture, then yes, they are lacking species. Though I personally haven't seen a peacock lick, but yeah. Sure. I had another question, if I may ask. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, since now, uh, this is not exactly. Actually, it is not at all the interlocking, but it is about the uh, sexual selection. Okay. So, since most of the bird species, or even in most of the other animals, we have uh, the males doing the play and the team choosing whether partner. Uh, the, huh? uh, how does the male know which is the one? Which? Sorry, sorry. How does the male know? There could be many females that might. So, uh, in the middle of play, much. Of your voice is breaking, Govind. No. I'm sorry. Oh, wait, who's talking? V Sant is talking. I'm so confused. I, I am right. Yeah. Yeah, wait, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, may I? Yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. So, uh, mostly it is the males that, uh, you know, uh, uh, take part in showing the displays of their lovely or moms or whatever it is. So, it is the males who invest in displays, right? Right. And the female chooses the male. Sure. So how does the male instead know, say if a male has uh, three, four uh, females that are there in its territory, so does the male have any role choosing which is a fitter female? <laughs> or no. is, it only, and is, is it always unidirectional that the female decides it? Yeah, in these cases, yeah, it seems to be very u- unidirectional because uh, it's mostly, uh, the you have the, the thing as the choose your sex, so the one that invests more in the uh, like because of anisogamy the female's parental investment is much more than the male's so in this case she is the choosier sex and she gets to choose the male right because the males don't invest anything in parental care or even in sperm as compared to the egg that the female invests in and in addition to that she also heavily invests in parental care does that does that make sense? There are like a huge number of videos on YouTube as well uh, uh, regarding this. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So you have the choose your sex based on investment. Yeah, Gopin, go ahead. Uh, I can't hear you. Voice is breaking. Sorry. Not clear, not clear. Yeah, go in. Yeah, just type the question. Uh, okay, so Haridharan asks, what's the minimum number of males required for licking? I don't know. Great question. I don't know. Discussion forum, probably. Sachin has put a link on peafowl licking, which is excellent. I shall look this up. 
uh, yeah, Govind just typed the question. Oh, Govind, I think, has left. He'll probably rejoin. Priya asks, is it always that all females decide on the same male during lecking? Hmm. There are probably like so many males. I think she probably does a huge round of going around, taking her own sweet time. And there are there is a chance that certain males get more favored than other males. I'm not sure about extra pet copulation that happens in lecking species. And I'm not sure if uh, it is a thing. But uh, probably males being a part of a lek uh, get more of a chance to uh, breed as opposed to males that are not a part of the leg. So, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if all females always decide on only one male. I'm, I'm sure there are a bunch of dominant males. Yeah, probably depends on the leg size as well. Ma'am, I uh, could. Yeah, Govind. Uh, could you uh, hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I think the more uh, males yeah, okay, my get a was, chance to make Priya. Yeah, go ahead. Well, the point I wanted to add was, do polyandrous species uh, display lacking? Because uh, you, there was a question about, uh, the question was whether uh, females, whether there's a reversal and females display Yeah, Sachin asked that. Yeah, so I have polyandrous I haven't, I haven't, I did Google this up. I can't remember the answer, but there are formations of females that come together. I'm not sure if it is for displaying and I'm not sure if they are polyandrous species, but uh, we can probably, yeah, pick this up uh, in the next session if someone has some data or anything on it. Yeah. So female, females uh, display in legs, no idea. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go to the videos that Lakshmi said that she had watched. Uh, so everyone can also have a look in case you haven't. Uh, it's from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, let me know if you can hear the audio. I'm Mark This Dance. is the one. Yeah, Biology. this is the one which is. Uh, Can you hear the audio? What you're looking at now is a lek. Yes, specifically it's a greater sage grass lek. A lek is a gathering of males on traditional breeding ground, where they're all displaying to attract mates. The males are the ones with the spiky tails. The females are out there too. They're the smaller, grayer ones. It looks like chaos birds running around helter-skelter, but in reality it's an organized, highly structured social interaction. And I'm going to walk you through it. Each and every one of those females will choose a mate, but only a few of the males will be chosen. To us, all the males basically look the same. The question is, how do the females choose, and why are so few of the males successful? Yeah, and there's like another video as well. I'm Mark Dansker, a biologist at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Sorry, what you're looking at now is a lek, specifically a it's greater sage lek. Yeah, I don't know why it's not switching. Lek is a gathering of... Uh, is it stuck? Okay. Let's take a look at what the males are doing. They seem to be just randomly out there, but each of the males is defending a little territory. It's his turf for displaying. Let's zoom in on just one and, and see what he's doing out there. He's displaying on this little patch of dirt that he calls his own, and he's dead set on no one else using it. And then his neighbor starts to walk over. Here he comes charging up to the, to the boundary. Here they start facing past each other. This is sort of a classic stance at a territorial boundary. They're reinforcing the boundary with their behavior, and they're jockeying to see if they're going to go ahead and fight. Now, these two males know each other very well. They've done this hundreds 
of time by now, probably in the same exact spot. But only sometimes do they actually fight. Often they just get in this posture and squawk back and forth at each other. And what's funny to watch is most of the time they'll walk away like that. They'll just turn their back and start to walk away. And then he sees something in his neighbor's posture and he's drawn back into the boundary. Oops. Saw an opening, took a punch. I call it a punch, but they're really hitting each other with their wrist. That's the front part of their wing there, trying to gain an advantage. And then they're locked in that facing pass display again. Oh, whack. Lots of posturing. They'll do this dozens of times a day. They're really exhausting each other, seeing who can deal with it. The best of the males are the ones who can do that every day and still be there on the day the females show up, ready to go, ready to rumble, and ready to display. Yeah, all right. So uh, those were the videos on um, the lacking behavior of the grouse species. So yeah, oh god, this is playing again. One second, let me just head to the next question. Okay, so lacking behavior is likely to evolve in a situation where resources are scarce and need to be strongly defended resources are abundant and there is no need to defend it where males skew the adult sex ratio in their favor or where females skew the adult sex ratio in their favor okay why what do you mean by skew uh it's altered so females are more than uh males By in their favor, which means that males are greater than females. Right yes, now. yes, yes, yes. A D. Ma'am, uh, this is related to a point raised in the previous question, ma'am. Uh, wherein uh, there was this, I don't know who said it, I'm sorry, but uh, they said that the resources are uh, uh, dispersed and it's far-fetched and they are, well, that's why uh, the males congregate in one place and uh, compete. So it should have been A, no ma'am. <laughs> Well, I'm quite enjoying this, but uh, there's actually, it's the correct answer is actually B, <laughs> where resources are abundant and there's no need to defend it, right? That's why all the males are congregated in one area. And this is uh, in the lecture as well. Um, I didn't quite understand it, I'm sorry. So the resources are abundant and there is no need to defend it because males usually defend territories which have good resources, right? Yes, yes. So here all males are congregating together in an area where uh, clearly like there is uh, no need for defending their own territory. So there is no, there, there aren't any territories here. Oh, okay. Right? Oh, I, I get it right, ma'am. Uh, since the yeah, resources are abundant, the population is spread out and there is less chance of meeting one individual female. So, licking is the way for all females and males to come together. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, ma'am. Actually, I did the mistake of uh, misunderstanding the word term resources, ma'am. Resources here is the availability of female. Right. But uh, I took it the general, uh, general umbrella term, you know, the food and the uh, territory and every, all sorts of things. So I got it, it, it is the general term, I think, but I mean, not not in relation to females, right? Right. Uh, okay, ma'am. I will read upon it, ma'am. 
yeah so so basically uh, basically like they 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 are not defending any territories right so usually a female will also choose a male that has a better territory wow there is someone joining the class now okay uh yeah ma'am in the previous question somebody either you or somebody else raised this point that when the resources are dispersed in a particular given area so the uh, uh, dispersal is not uh, abundant at in that uh, during that time only the uh, necessity of uh, uh, lacking is arises you know yeah so resources are abundant they are scattered means they are present everywhere right so there are multiple individuals in multiple places and there is no need to yeah gobind there is no need to defend a particular territory based on resource availability uh, it, i was going to say that it wasn't resources that was mentioned in that point it was the population the population is spread out so the yeah yes i i am Okay. okay. It clearly is not my idea. I guess now I'm not able to understand. I will already talk about. No, that's okay. No problem. No problem at all. So I am just wondering. I mean, would would the two not go together in the sense that if resources are abundant, then populations or rather communities don't really have to, uh, you know, flock together to specific places and then they are dispersed. Sure. Yeah. So the chance of meeting a mate is very low. Right. If resources are abundant. the chance of encountering a male or a female or both of them encountering each other is low right so if they want to uh, maximize their reproductive fitness i'm just thinking like off my head as to why a particular situation like this could evolve uh, an activity like lekking just brings together males and females to one particular uh, area right because in this case uh, like defending a territory is not uh, what do you say valuable to an individual because it's just everywhere uh, ma'am yeah govin ma'am i would like to add a point uh, i i recall uh, listening to this in the lecture uh, it's not resource abundance that is important when it comes to evolution of lacking it's a resource uh, dispersal man for example resource dispersal could be abundant but it could be bunched up into few areas correct correct sure abundant so go ahead so i would say abundance is the right word more like uh, resource uh, displacement or or yeah uh maybe e- sure okay yeah it's not clumped in one area it's more uh, i don't know widespread dispersed the distribution sure 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 yeah so it does not give an uh, an instance for multiple encounters of males and females because they are yeah present over like or scattered over a larger area yeah does that does that sound okay abundant and uh, i mean uh, abundant and dispersed according to me well distributed because if it is scarce you are going to have the need to protect it anyway correct yes sure yeah yeah i would agree with that okay let me just go to the next question okay sexual selection and mate choice in birds occurs primarily via visual cues vocal cues olfactory cues both a and b Is there really no uh, data availability or no information about the factory cues in this situation? Same doubt to me also, ma'am. Yeah, uh, I I am not aware. 
uh, I don't think birds are, so what do bird, uh, so what do animals usually use as olfactory cues for sexual selection do you have any idea musk uh, musks and they were pheromones 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 yeah pheromones yeah i'm 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 not aware of pheromones in any bird species uh, i'm not sure if it's there but yeah so yes uh, uh, what about turkey vultures which one vultures Turkey vultures. Turkey vultures. Do they do they have pheromones? Uh, I, I I'm not sure. I, you can you can tell me. Not not pheromones, ma'am. But I do. I heard. I I once heard that turkey vultures have one of the largest olfactory senses of birds or uh, in in birds, and they have very very good sense of smell. So I wonder if they may or may not uh, choose mates based on. Mm, mm, not sure. I I don't know if that is only for for aging purposes or it is for uh, mate selection. I'm assuming it's to find food. Yes, ma'am. It is to find food. Would they smell carrion with their uh, sense of smell? But I'm wondering since they have a great sense of smell, they may also have uh, uh, use olfactory cues unlike other birds. Mm okay so let's just go with this hypothetical situation uh if if they have good olfactory cues uh how does sexual selection come into play like could you think of of someone's uh yeah vedang has sent pheromones and birds myth or reality okay i haven't read this but what is this Yes, yes. Oh, there is. Okay, so some birds do have pheromones for communication. Okay, interesting. This is a closed article. Need to find out the full text. Oh, it's a free article. Okay, we can we can explore this later. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah. So for this hypothetical uh situation. Uh, what would need to come into play for olfaction to feature in sexual selection? A good sense of smell. Hmm. Who should have a good sense of smell? The species in question. Uh, female, female mostly, ma'am. Okay. Why should the female have a good sense of smell? Because the doy part is. Yeah, usually showy part and the show off. Males has the show offs, ma'am. So males have to. Uh, uh, males are the ones who are gonna dissipate the uh, hormones, and females have to catch it. If at all it happens in birds. Oh, okay, okay, that's sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a hypothetical thing, so anyone can think. Yeah, of but anything. if it if, if it is reverse, then it will be polyandrous. Right. So one sex needs to have a heightened. uh all factory cues or whatever uh, abilities ma'am. right uh yeah uh, i ma'am, think uh, vedan you... wanted to mention something once again go with uh okay vedan doesn't have anything to say uh yeah go ahead uh, govin i w- i was going to say that um, it would make sense for birds with an already well developed uh, olfactory sense to choose mates based on uh, pheromones like right, ma'am not that uh, in like it's a chicken or egg situation in this case uh, olfactory sense evolved first then the pheromones not the other way around sure sure yeah it's a evolution of pheromones but in this case both the males and the females have a good olfaction system right in these turkey vultures i my what, what i was Now what I yes ma'am. What I was trying to say is, uh, all the the use of pheromones to uh, choose mates uh, would mean would need a good sense of smell. So the the great olfactory sense is already uh, present in the set bird. Uh, the sure. set predisposes them to. Sure. So I would sure. say that uh, it's not necessary that only one uh, one. Um, 
But it should be differential, right? It should be differential. Otherwise, there'll be no selection if everyone is equally equipped. Unless the pheromone is of different strengths or something. I don't know. Correct. That will play a role, right? I mean, the sense of smell will be same across the species globally. But the males having better uh, way of expressing that pheromones or something will be... Uh, or maybe, instead of saying male or female, it will be the receiver and the... Uh, Sender and receiver. Will be, uh, sure. Uh, if we talk in that term, that will be better uh, because because of the small entry and uh, monogamy or, or whatever, uh, those categories that will define who is the receiver and who is the uh, Sure. Receiver. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yes, Ravan. So what I was saying is, if the birds are communicating through olfactory mm-hmm. uh, cues, then they should be communicating. So they should be dispersed, uh, distributed in a place, but uh, may not be like uh, uh, interacting or uh, counter uh, frequently. Should communicate. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Distance would play a part in this. Uh, they have to be close enough uh, that the uh, pheromones or whatever olfactory cues are uh, received by the receiver. Of course, it's not like acoustics that can be transmitted. Actually, I don't even yeah. know. Yeah. Right. It, it, it depends. Yeah. Probably. I don't know. It depends on the how volatile these pheromones are, which I do think they are. But yeah, anyone like can a, correct me. Like a, like a tiger or a dog, uh, it communicates at uh, urinating at our place and the other, uh, like if uh, the male urinates and the female uh, comes across our right. pheromones and then uh, correct. they get communicated. Yeah. In the same way it should be. Yeah, for the, sure. But for the birds, like it is, uh, how they can communicate, like uh, what type of birds use this type of uh, communication yeah it's just hypothetical situation since uh, govan mentioned turkey vultures have a heightened uh, sense of olfaction so we were just discussing it uh, i don't also, think i think albatrosses have that uh, uh, what sexual i mean or mate choice based on olfaction or uh, something no i mean they have a, oh, albatrosses I think have a high uh, olfactory sense, I'm not sure though, okay. I remember seeing it somewhere. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, and I think we can just follow up on this paper that has been shared by Vedan. I hope it should be ground birds, ground nesting birds. Ground, yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, the table is like. The board is open for multiple points, but I'm going to move on for now. Uh, Okay, so you have a figure alongside or an image. So what is the species? What is depicted in this image? And what kind of mating system can this be? We'll go with hand raising for replies. It's a power bird. Yeah, okay. Okay, I got that. What power bird is this? Um, bluish bower bird. I I forgot. Oh. Just forgot the name. Uh, okay, it's a it's a satin bow bird. So that's what it is called. Okay, so uh, what's happening out here? Okay, Lakshmi, go ahead. Uh, I don't know, Shavan, if your hand is raised uh, with this the, question or the they previous. are creating bowers which are elaborate. Uh, nesting kind of stuff which they don't use for nesting but only to attract the females and the females comes and checks each bower and which bower uh, interests them much and impresses them they mate with that uh, uh, creator and uh, these bowers are el- uh, elaborate and big big uh, um, umbrage type of uh, installation which uh, is decorated with colorful objects uh, um, they tend to favor uh, bluish color objects more, but there are also, uh, uh, they neatly arrange groups of color, based on colors, the things, stuffs, stuffs can be anthropogenic also. 
and uh, the in nature the flowers and in the plastic bottles caps and everything and they neatly arrange the bowers and they show their capacity in that way and the female uh, they um, they um, uh, visit each bower individually and they check they take out their own speed time and then they decide on the uh, male to mate and even in the meantime the juveniles who are getting the less life lessons learned through this elder adult birds they tend to uh, uh, steal these uh, uh, colorful stuff from the bowers and they try to mimic and create their own bowers but although not for mating but uh, as a tuition as a tutorial type okay okay sure yeah i did not know about the juvenile yeah. part uh, yeah one second govind i think uh, sachin and shravan had their hand raised anything from both of you yeah sachin Yeah. Mm. Bye. Yeah, sure. I was about to say yeah, sure. the same answer what Lucky was saying. Okay. And this mating system is polygynous, where uh, multiple females may have the same uh, male partner. Right. Okay. Sure. Yeah. That's that's correct. Uh, so, Anmol. Yeah, Shavan. Yeah. so this is again connect uh, connects to like behavior so uh, this is again the like is like a stage arranged for uh, display okay so this is a stage which a male bird had decorated it with the specific colors and uh, then it attract the female and it yeah sure but uh, that that is quite different yes you are right in the sense that both are displays but they are very different displays one is where it is a congregation of multiple males displaying in a particular arena but here it is only one male displaying yes. in his arena there are yes. no multiple females also. one right. female visits many bowers it's not that many females visit one bower it's the reverse you know one female Versus the many multiple, as uh, Sachin said, it's a, a polygynous. So one female will mate with many multiple males. So like in his opposite male way, one male will mate with multiple females. I'm oh, sorry. Ah, uh, no. yeah. Here the female comes uh, to mate with the male. Yeah, the female chooses. She can, if she yeah. likes the bower, she chooses the male, and then she, uh, yeah, yeah, mates then with the male. The male, male may station at one place. पॉइंट the satin bower bird favors bluish objects mm -hmm. and they use anthropogenic objects but in nature blue is, uh, is the rarest color right now so okay. before uh, uh, the humans came on the scene how did they get their blues uh, i'm i'm not sure they might be like flowers or something bluish colored or even bluish grayish i'm not sure about the color scale and to whatever uh, the visual uh, band within which they pick stuff but yeah i don't know if this is a recently evolved uh, trait or it, they, i think they also have an affinity towards shiny objects so yeah blue and shiny or was it shiny before i'm i'm not sure yeah good question though but yeah is it indicating the branch that has been covered in the forest area sorry sorry is it indicating the branch by me so it is in this image clearly right you have like bottle yeah. caps and spoons and everything no. uh, yeah. yeah the other aspect that i wanted to understand in this system is that every male is having his own area where it is making a power and decorating it with other objects right, right. how does he actually get the females to enter that area how oh so i think they do like displays and i think they mate when the female enters the bower or something like that correct me if i'm wrong i'm sure there are lots of videos there uh, 
uh, but uh, yeah they do like a dance and a display and try and woo the female so, and that, that is the end part right I'm trying to say that females are somewhere else how does the female like, find she's probably uh, like on the just on the lookout oh okay yeah so, male remains in that uh, bower or around the bower and then yeah i was thinking whether he actually you know she or uh, guides her to that place or something oh like i am i'm not sure of that yeah good question i'm not During sure your training season the this bower's uh, uh, station at one place i mean at this place the display it means is this a common area for display uh it's not common for all the male birds are like it's it's own like this single male uh guards this place for bowers yeah i'm not sure if all bowers are in the same area probably not but i'm assuming it should be an open clearing in the forest where the probability of encountering a female is higher than the rest yeah some open space but uh, yeah so females are the ones that make so this is not a nest in case anybody was wondering females make the nest and lay the eggs in like a nest this is just a bower structure um that's probably the reason why the decoration is done to attract females yes surely yes yeah as to what the female is selecting for in particular amount of blue objects amount of um display the quality of the bower i don't know what is the weightage given to everything but yeah everything is to attract the female and uh, draw her. ma'am uh, just to add on to your last point uh, there is this video about uh, in the cornell's uh, list where they did uh, assert that the female uh, decides particular uh, you know uh, mate uh, in most showiest most uh, extravagant preparation as well as uh they equal weightage both for the uh, arrangement of the bower and the way uh, he displays and dances in the last how he woos okay so it's uh, equal 50 50 and in the uh, bowers they look for showiest and brightest uh, you know uh, things to be used that's why many hens uh, they steal from others to make theirs better <laughs> okay Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the info, Lakshmi. Yeah. Uh, yes, Sachin. So I'm still sort of not very really sure about this system. The reason being, the female has to go to each of the bower to find what is the most attractive. Correct. The male, right? Correct. Now, uh, how does she know that there are no pending bowers or something like that, right? Oh, she's that probably. No that's true you know she must be probably visiting multiple bowers and uh, revisiting them again i'm not sure but that could be a possibility right yes yeah, something like that and then yeah because uh, it's like if she visits three or four and then there are another 10 again at some so is it like a regional bower competition kind of thing <laughs> yeah i'm not <laughs> i don't think she's going to fly great distances she'll be within obviously uh, that is true yeah, yeah the dispersal range of the bird itself but uh, yeah interesting question i am not sure uh, what lengths a female bower bird would go to find her ideal match like that so would be so the, do the the foraging principle apply there the energy versus the gain Thing. yeah sure i mean how much would she want to invest to find another male and also probably a first time bird would be uh, evaluating different from a uh, already uh, a bird that is breeding for the second year because uh, she would already have some baseline information on what bowers are is she looking for so yeah mm. uh need Ma'am, to make uh, position i have a i have a one second one second one second yes position of bowers need to be strategic uh, uh they need to be in open places where a female is more likely to pass and probably these birds have been living like with i don't know how far their dispersal distance is but they probably know where uh, females are more likely to go or walk or pass and 
they would strategically they i don't know if there are like prime locations to put your bower but if there are there might be some yeah competition to do that bowers itself are huge and uh, elaborate so uh, they, they so they need a lot of space area. right uh, they, already the bowers need a lot of space yeah so it might be that a fewer female males are completing because uh, of lack of open spaces of uh, mm. uh, i'm not sure the bowers are very elaborate and it takes a lot of investment of energy as well as space and resources and time so maybe that uh, um, suitable males are less and uh, uh, i don't know about that but Yeah, maybe they are more. They just. Yes, ma'am, it was. Uh, yeah, go with. It was mentioned in the lecture actually, ma'am, that uh, there is equal weightage is given both to the construction of the bower itself and to the location of the bower. Okay. So, uh, so the birds, the females are most likely to visit. Uh, most likely have certain uh, good locations in mind uh, when they go searching, and if they find the bowers there. They inspect the bowers' uh, construction, all that. Right. If a bower, regardless, if a good bower is built in a bad location, they it will probably be missed. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I have. I also have just one more question. Yeah. Uh, do they do females come? Do females compare different bowers? uh like they they go to different bowers see which one is the best yeah. or do they have some kind of predetermined standard or like they see a good bower the first time and they decide that it's the one for me the yeah, that's exactly what uh, sachin had uh, mentioned brought up earlier i have uh, no idea but uh, in my opinion like a first time breeder uh, bird would have lesser experience than a bird that is breeding for the second time so she might have a better idea of what uh she would choose as a successful male or not but yeah no idea okay so vedang has uh what is it uh, why such an interesting trait could have evolved could it be due to an affected sex ratio yeah so okay so this handicap Uh, principle is of a great debate so we can probably leave that i think we are almost like 3 minutes time up time uh, but this handicap principle is being debated greatly by both parties apparently it's invalid or apparently it is valid but there have been so many things based on this zahavi's handicap principle so uh if you want like i don't know if they have like paper discussions but i can share like a paper you can divide yourself in two groups and have a debate on this and i can moderate it but uh, yeah i do not sure what is affected sex ratio what is affected sex ratio i think you might skew no i'm just trying to ask if uh, okay in a previous generation probably some long time ago mm-hmm. when the trade to war probably there was a lack of females in the area so the males Try to woo in as many females as possible by making the bow, uh, designing bows and making them attractive by using such materials. Yeah, I would not like to address evolutionary questions like this without any background. But everyone is free to discuss and hypothesize. But uh, yeah, so yeah, so first we need to do like you need to yeah you need to find like a sorry. No, I found the topic discussion. That's the reason I brought this point up. Yeah, so yeah. I, I mean, thought that we could discuss more of it. Yeah, yeah. Although there is positive time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, no problem. I mean, keep the questions coming in. I feel having discussions is much more interesting than looking at MCQs. Uh, personally, I'm not sure about everyone else, but uh, yeah, as I said, like if we could have like some paper discussion, if anyone could find like a. Um, a, a, an interesting paper that they would like to discuss, which we can have like two sides to it. Uh, we can divide it and maybe like spend about fifteen uh, to twenty minutes of the session discussing that. Or uh, even this I'm very actually, question. Actually, yeah. uh, actually, I am against uh, the handicap hypothesis just because it's just one second, ma'am. Because uh, the I I would say I would uh, I want to say that here this in this session we had. 
uh, focus on males which are uh, uh, going the extra mile to woo the females. So in the, in the down in the uh, next generations to come, it will be so perfect and perfected and perfected that the male will finally will perish after a particular amount of uh, uh, generations because each generation will add on to more perfection in the way they look, the plumages, the way they uh, woo the uh, female, everything. Uh, there will come a point where the investment of energy to woo will outweigh the investment of, uh, uh, you know, uh, self-maintenance and living. And uh, slowly the male will, uh, you know, die off. So what's the whole point of having such cumbersome... Uh, yeah, so there is something to do with like parasite load as well. We're not going to go into discussions now, so guys. Sorry, <laughs> Govind, I'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> Because otherwise I know we'll overshoot for time. I, I actually have, I have an example to what, uh, to the point Lakshmi said, ma'am. There's an actual uh, example of uh, an animal that went, became extinct because of that. Okay. It's called the Irish elk or something. It's an, uh, uh, of course, it, it had massive antlers, like the largest antlers uh, uh, ever uh, known, ever known to have existed. That it put so much effort, so much effort into these uh, growing these very large antlers that uh, at, it came to a point where they couldn't really sustain themselves anymore, and they became uh, extinct. Yeah, this point was raised. What I said, this point was raised by, uh, was raised in uh, Cornell's video where uh, the birds of paradise, uh, par paradise found in Papua New Guinea and all those uh, area. They are going in that path. That's what that video was all about. Where the whole uh, race of birds, there, the whole part of birds there are very showy and extravagant and you know, garish and every stuff. So I saw that in that video. That's why I got that idea. Right. Yeah. So there is this uh, parasite load. So the more more the showy, larger the plumage, more the number of parasites that they can hold. But the fact that they are still uh, surviving despite all of that shows a level of fitness so yeah I think the discussions can go like in multiple directions but let's hold this uh, we've already been here for two hours uh, ma'am ma ma one minute uh, this is not about the discussion I'm sorry to sound naive I'm new to online classes or such stuff uh, do you have any idea how to access the discussion forum ma'am uh, there is a once again let me just send you the link uh, I think you can you can access it via the Swayam profile. Yeah, okay. Uh, Sachin has put in. A I was link. asked to introduce myself, but I don't know where to go. On Here, I think there. Sachin's just put in a link. Maybe just access it via this. But it should be on your Swayam portal. There is, I think, something like discussions. I'm not. Uh, okay, ma'am. Just click I, this I link. I have this. I have the screen, ma'am. The one which link Sachin sir gave, but I'm not able to find the intro. Uh, Right. Oh, because it's probably at the bottom. Like maybe go to this is one of third. Yeah, I, I went yeah. to the last. I went in the last. That's why I asked, ma'am. I feel very uh, stupid to ask this question, but I am new to this whole uh, online. No, that's process. that's okay. But uh, just go to the last one. What's the first thing that you see? I am not sure where the thread is, but if anyone finds the thread, uh, could you please uh, share it with... Uh, I sent it. Okay. Alright, yeah, Sachin's gotten it. Yeah, just... Uh, yeah, introduce yourself. Perfect. Govin, do you have a question or is it a technical <laughs> statement? Sorry, ma'am. Sorry for asking technical questions. No, no, no problem. Sorry, ma'am. I, I had already raised my hand previously. Okay, okay, cool. No, great discussion. Happy to have all of you here uh, putting up really awesome questions and uh, also discussing. But uh, let's hold uh, this for the next session. It's, yeah, we have, we have over short time. Uh, yeah, I'll catch you in the next session. Yeah, in fact, a... yeah. Sorry? No, are there still a few questions remaining? Yes, there are quite a few questions are remaining. There a few remaining questions? Yeah, that is fine. I mean, I think we'll have one of the last sessions for a recap. So I'll I'll just have those questions there. So don't worry about that. But 
I in fact had a lot more discussion questions, but uh, I'm glad we've had these uh, things discussed. So uh, let's all catch catch up next Tuesday. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Uh. Oops, sorry, I think I left. Someone was talking. Okay, we'll catch up next.